McKinsey does publicity stunts all the time, mm -hmm. um, but you don't actually see how the government that he is running is actually being built to to, to capacity and be so functional. that when he, it, and be functional. Mm -hmm. You know, it's easy to run around and you know do things at swimming pools and roads and tar factories. I mean, those things are easy. You, we can do that today. You throw money at it, it's done. But actual governance is very very hard. So, so you're saying most of what he does is gimmicks. It's not necessarily functional and there's longevity to it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's publicity stunts. You reckon, um, yeah. So, so, like I said, it's, it's easy to... Politicians do it all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, they open stadiums and they open halls. And those, that, those are easy things. Um, you but put, Chris, but, aren't you doing publicity stunts as well then? Because So there are aspects of my life um, that I will never reveal. Um, that are between myself, my family, on the third day, on the third day uh, sorry. Sorry. that's that one, yeah. <laughs> like Christ himself. What was that about? I don't even and know. You went to I a don't fancy know. Restaurant, um, um, in a beautiful place in South Africa, and he Maustel. left you with Love them. seven thousand them. Ooh, babe. He's not circumcised. I, mean, I, <laughs> I mean, not just so it, for Mama Fundis and all of that. I mean, I heard the, the audible voice of God. It wasn't the decision. It wasn't just. But don't ask me hard questions. <laughs> um, you're probably the busiest man in South Africa, I think. I don't know. I think there's people busier, but I like to keep myself busy. I, the, uh, I think there is a <clears throat> difference between busy and productive. That's true. And I definitely say you're one of the most productive men in South Africa because there's a, lot of, there's a lot of people who attend meetings, go on nice SAA flights that are sponsored by the minister, what, what's that ministerial handbook? Oh, uh, yes, yeah, yeah. They've got a million flights that they attend to. They go to Parliament and say nothing. They sit in Cape Town. By the way, it's so expensive to go to Cape Town at the moment. I'm like, is it even economical for people to be going up and down to go sit there it's, on it's, benches? It's, it's funny how during COVID, we, we had online meetings, but yes. it suddenly became convenient again to fly to Cape Town once COVID was over. I mean, they want the wine, wine root estate. They want that life again. <laughs> throw, throw jugs at each other and helmets and the rest of it, yeah. <laughs> Mayor Chris Pappas, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. Surviving, we're getting this. Are you? Are you? Yes, so this show is called Engineer Your Life. Um, my name is Lunga Loke. Um, I think I've been trying to get you for three months. Yes, yeah, we've been missing each other, I think. Yeah, I think we... I was supposed to come down to Durban today, yes. and there was a meeting cancelled, and yeah. But, uh, yeah. Like, but we're here now. We're but here. it's good to finally meet you. You ran an incredible campaign to, 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 uh, to get to the seat, because many of us didn't know who you are. You're a youngster in your early 30s. We were like... Who's this guy who's being so vigorous during your campaign? Your campaign was in 2021? Yes, yeah, end of yes. 2021, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You were so vigorous about that campaign. Was it, was it an intentional to be like that? Of course. Mm -hmm. um, but our campaign didn't start then. Our, our campaign, we, we started, I mean, it's been an 18-year journey to win the municipality. But the actual campaign for 2021 mm -hmm. started in 20, when was it, 2018. Mm -hmm. That's when the campaign started. So mm -hmm. while people were you know, fighting in constitutional courts about whether elections must happen and all these things. We were on the ground yeah, talking yeah, to people yeah. And, and, yeah, so it's been intense for three years, essentially, up until 2021. Um, and and uh, I'd, I'd, um, I mean, I know he's departed the, 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 the DA recently, but definitely it's because you had good backing from Mr. Zwagele Mwango. Yeah, I mean... As the leader at the time. He did, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean Zwagele did um, give us a lot, of, a lot of his support and a lot mm -hmm. of his energy. And then uh, Francois took over from him then, mm -hmm. um, sort of mid-campaign. Mid mm -hmm. And we got uh, great support from Francois as well. So, yeah, the, the drive to win this municipality, because we knew we were so close, um, you know, successive leaders, even before um, Zwax's time, um, mm -hmm. you know, we, we had good support. Hanif was supporting us when, you know, when he was chairperson. So it's, it's been good. Uh, did, are you happy about his leaving? Maybe happy is not the best word, but it, was, it a, was it time or is it oh, something that happened and you guys are just dealing with it now? Well, I think a political party is a voluntary organization, so mm -hmm. people come and go all the time. Um, obviously, you never, you never want to lo lose people. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it's sad when you do lose people. Everyone's got their own reasons. Um, but, I mean, if, if you look at, at, at Zwagele's um, career, I mean, he's, he, he started as Etekuni leader, he you. went to the legislature, he became the, the provincial party leader, um, you know, so where to next from him? It's so a he, very rich career. Yeah, yeah and, and he's young. So, yeah. so what do you do next, mm. you know? So for me, you know, despite all the rhetoric that you hear in the, in, in the media and things, that's what politicians do. But I think it's just a matter of, you know, what can I do next in my, my political career? Because you, you, you don't go from being party leader to be a backbencher and then be satisfied with, with that. Um, 
So yeah, I, I, if I was him, I would have I would have crafted my political career the next step differently. You mm -hmm. know, to go to a national level or to to look at it differently within the DA. Within the DA, yeah. yeah. I mean, he, he, but for me, it's almost a regression. Mm -hmm. You've gone to I hear you a smaller startup company. Yeah, sort of. and and you 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 know we elect leaders in mm. the DA in, in Action SA. You, you get appointed. appointed yeah. So so he's been appointed to lead no one. Essentially, here in KZN, because he still needs to build up a constituency. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, so for me, it's a regression mm -hmm. um, where there's actually a lot more opportunities for him within the DA um, if he had chosen his path. But I think you know he's probably chosen the easier, the easier route. The easier route being let me just be made a chairperson and mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. I suddenly lead something as opposed to let me work my way or fight my way because there's a lot of competition in the DA. Um, to Is it really bigger. leadership, though, if you're just appointed by an individual who's a leader? I'll let you answer. I'll let you answer that question. You've, you've got a whole political party with appointed people. There's never been an you. election in the, in the organisation. So yeah, from the top to you know everyone's appointed, which is great, I suppose, but wait until their first congresses and their second congresses. Look, yeah. at, look at Cope. Yeah. Cope was the, the saviour of South Africa at one stage, however many percent they got, and now they're busy tackling each other in meetings. So yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the kind of thing. People mm. get, there was the purple cows at one stage. You know, remember oh, yes. the purple cows? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, the capitalist saviours of whatever, <laughs> they never got one seat, they, you know, they don't exist anymore. So yeah. that's politics for you. I mm -hmm. think South Africans in general... They, they want or we want um, action, we want something new, we want something different. But ourselves, we don't understand how politics works in South Africa. So we want this instant solution, but the, the solution's not instant. It's, yeah. it's built over time. And yeah. I mean, we proved that in this municipality, it took mm. us 18 years to win. Yes, um, yes. And when we've won, it's going to take us you know, 10, 15 years to see the vision that we want to see. You know, that's how long these things take. So the instant gratification of starting a political party or just be given a, a position, it, it's not, not reality of politics in South Africa. We see, what's this gentleman's name? Um, the PA, Gayton McKenzie. Yes. I mean, Gayton McKenzie does publicity stunts all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't actually see how the government that he is running is actually being built to, to, to capacity. And be so that when he, And be functional. Mm -hmm. You know, it's easy to run around and, you know, do things at swimming pools and roads and tar factories. I mean, those things are easy. You can, we can do that today. You throw money at it, it's done. But actual governance is very, very hard. So, so you're saying most of what it does is gimmicks. It's not necessarily functional and there's longevity to it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's publicity stunts. You reckon, um, yeah. So, so, like I said, it's, it's easy to... Politicians do it all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, they open stadiums and they open halls. and Those, that, those are easy things. Um, you but put, Chris, but, aren't you doing publicity stunts as well then? Because you're very public about how you lead, you're very public about your achievements, about what you've done. Um, surely there's a level of publicity that's important when you are a politician. Of course, you know? of course. People, people want to see what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, don't get me wrong. People want to see that their money is being sent correctly or that you're making good decisions, and that's important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's the PR of, of the job. Um, but then there's also the hard work that you have to do and are you willing to share that hard work are you willing to share to say we have problems in our supply chain management department and we're trying to deal with them uh, and this is what the steps that we're taking those aren't sexy things people don't really you. want to know but people want yeah. to see you cutting a ribbon or whatever it might be um <laughs> filling a pothole with the machine <laughs> filling it filling a dirt road with the machine yeah but so, so yeah, I mean, there, there is a level of, of communication. There is a level of, of publicity stunts. That's politics. You know, different jobs have different things. Um, but then there's also the reality of, of good governance. Um, and those are the things that you see, for example, you pay off a, a loan. You know, we paid off a 10 million rand loan. Mm -hmm. And as much as publicizing it is a publicity stunt, because you want people to know the good work that you've done, but at the same time, that is good governance. You've managed to stabilize finances. You've made good financial decisions. Now, when you look at, at some, you know, some of the, the newer people who have you know, just gotten into power be through corruption and coalitions mm -hmm. and all these deals that they make, you ask yourself, well, what good governance steps have you taken? You know, how, how many officials have been disciplined? What's mm -hmm. your consequence management structures that you've set up? The things that aren't sexy, the things that take time, and you, know, you sit here till 10, 11 at night working on policies, um, which the, the public's not interested in that, yeah. but that's how government functions. Mm -hmm. No mm -hmm. business, even in your own household, you have rules. Yeah. Everyone knows everyone's rules role. Rules of conduct, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and those are the things that people don't see. They just see your happy family getting in the car and going on holiday. Yeah. But you, know, you have your family meetings, and you, you know, all of those sorts of things take, take place in the background. So yeah, 
uh, you, you have to publicize, you have to talk about your successes, but at the same time, also show us the hard things. Mm -hmm. Also show us where you, you might be failing a little bit. Show us what you find difficult. Mm -hmm. It's not my municipality. It's the public's institution. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's, you know, anyone who lives here, it's theirs. I'm only here for five years, mm -hmm. and then you know, someone else will come in or I'll get another chance. Yeah. But this institution will stay here for many, many years and has been here for many, many years, and it's not mine, it's not the DAs, it's not the ANCs, it's the public's. And that's what you got. I mean, that's what, what politicians have got to realize. Local government is the it's the public. Gumzulumena, Sugamlaz, Ekai Semlazi, and Gikule in the township for all my life until Natoli Tuba to go to university. I went to UKZN. Um, I had a middle, a middle, I wouldn't even say a middle class, a lower middle class single mother who raised me, put me through university, through good opportunities and good and diligence. I got a bursary. So um, the company that I work for employed me. But what I'm trying to get to is that Umuntun Jengami, who comes from not much, tries to build something for themselves. Why should I find Ikaya in the DA? Sure. Um, so the fundamental principle of the DA when it comes to governments and leading is that every South African needs to have equal opportunities in life to be able to succeed. So your background, as, you, as you've described it, might have been hampered because you know, the schools in, in your area don't offer a good quality education. Mm -hmm or there's frequent power outages so you can't study, or you, know, you might be in a single household because of you know, social circumstances in that particular area, whatever mm -hmm. the reason might be. Poor health care, so you couldn't get glasses. Yeah. The DA believes in, in making sure that the opportunities that you have growing up and the opportunities that I have growing up are not determined by the circumstances of your birth. So the school that you go to in Umlaz mm -hmm. and the school that I go to in Hilton mm -hmm. Um, offer us the same quality education, or at least a high enough quality education to be able to say it's actually not your education that yeah, is limiting you, I but it's you. your own it's your own decisions, drive or yeah. your own decisions. Yeah. And that is and that is broad because you can look at things, for example, like uh, school nutrition. Not having a meal impacts on something like that. Uh, public transport, um, health care, access to Wi-Fi. You know, th you know these 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 new sort of opportunities that need to be there. So that's what we try and do as, as the Democratic Alliance. We try and make sure that we provide access to opportunities. I, I because that. I can't force you. I can't force you to be good. I can't take you and, and, and a, just by virtue of giving you a position, suddenly make you an engineer or make you, you know, whatever you might want to be, just because you, you know, you're the color of your skin mm -hmm. or whatever the, the justification is. But if I say to you, here are all the opportunities in life. Here, and they're great opportunities, they're good opportunities. What you do with these, it's up to you. If you want to fail, it's not the government's fault. Government has provided you with these opportunities. I mean, you also, you also um, not necessarily open, but you, 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 you share a fair share of your personal life. I, I saw this on your Instagram. I don't know if you're engaged or married. Married, now. Engaged. Engaged, engaged. okay. So that, that says to me, the DA also welcomes diversity, um, diversity in leadership as well, because you find that a lot of politicians in parliament, I don't think I know even one who is openly queer and advocates for queerness. I'm not saying as a queer person, your private life and your sexuality should be at the forefront of your career. I sure. don't think it, should, it shouldn't be. It's not, it doesn't define you. It's just an aspect of who you are, right? But do you find completely welcome and undiscriminated in the position that you are, one, by fellow government leaders, and two, in the DA? So let me start with the second one. In the DA, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you look, we, we're sort of pioneers in, in, in that regard. So Mr. Uzakambed mm -hmm. um, was the first openly gay member of, of parliament in South Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Dean McPherson. There's a lot of people, um, you know, but what I'm showing is that it's not about, as you say, that's not your defining factor. It's yeah. just a, it's, it's a characteristic of yeah. who you are. Mm -hmm. What is more important is, are you able to deliver? You know, do you have the capacity, the abilities? Do you have the drive, the passion? Do you believe in what um, you know, the DA's vision is? And that's what we look at first. Whether you're a woman or a man or black or white or young or old or whatever it is, those are just characteristics that are arbitrary, essentially. I, I didn't choose the way that I was born, mm -hmm. um, whether my skin color or whatever it might be. But I did choose how good I can be at the position, how passionate I am about it, and that we look at. The second part of your question 
it's a bit different. Um, we are generally in a conservative country. Um, Would you say this area too is conservative? Less so than others, mm -hmm. um, but still um, relatively conservative when you look at you know, other parts of the world. But I've never, you know, gone to a public meeting or, you know, provided a report and the first thing that someone says is, it's not credible because you're gay. Mm -hmm. um, or we don't want to listen to you because you're gay. Mm -hmm. Having said that, though, you know, when there are tensions in the community, we had protests here three or four months ago about electricity disconnections, um, there are nasty people out there. So, you know, I'll get called all sorts of names. But, you know, so, so does someone who's overweight or I so does you. someone who yeah. is, you know, whatever it might be. So, so if you're considered different for whatever reason that people call you different, um, you get a slur anyway. You, you yeah. get it anyway. It's part of life. Yeah. Um, I've never been threatened physically. Mm -hmm. I've never been, you know, I've never had that. And perhaps maybe that is, you know, that's where my skin color is a privilege is because generally in, white, in South Africa, white LGBT members are less physically Prone, assaulted yeah, yeah. than in black communities. Absolutely. Um, so I've never had that. But even reading comments and reading um, just, you know, social media commentary, you can see that coming out. So I've never been attacked for my sexuality by the white community, publicly at least. Mm -hmm. But in the black community, it's not, just, it's not about me per se, but about the sexuality uh, in general. Uh, and you can see that coming out uh, in some in some comments. But again, it's not always. It's only a few people, and you know who they are, and you know why they're doing it, because they're trying to discredit the good work that you're doing, and they can't actually fault you for anything else. So what do we do? Let's turn to your age, sexuality, and skin color. I hear you. What do you think of the perception that the DA is a branch of the ANC? Per not at the ANC, actually, of Cyril Ramaphosa. Uh, isn't the argument usually that Cyril Ramaphosa is an agent of the DA? It's the other way <laughs> I hear um, you, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean, that's, it's, it's people's... I suppose people believe that because on one side you have Cyril Ramaphosa who is a capitalist. Mm -hmm. uh, he is a free market person. Uh, he believes in an open economy. Well, I suppose he chops and changes, you know, depending on what forum he's talking at. But I think that's probably why people say that. Yeah. Um, but that's just and I, those are DA principles too. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, the free market economy and things yes. like that. But I said it differs because Ramaphosa will stand up in other forums and talk about nationalisation and land expropriation and all sorts of things like that. But it, again, it just depends on. It's like a chameleon, depending on what uh, crowd you're talking to at the time and which Congress votes you're trying to to win. Um, but yeah, I mean, I can understand. And, and don't forget that is it's, that conversation is not born from the DA. The conversation is born from within the ANC. Um, from people who don't believe in his leadership style or you know, trying to cover up corruption or whatever it might be. So what do you do? You try and align um, your leader with the opposition. You say, you see, he's, he's, he's just like them. Um, <laughs> and then obviously it drives division. But yeah, I mean, there's some things that, there's some policy positions that, that Ramaphosa's government put forward that we, we believe in. You don't just oppose for the sake of opposing. Um, but there are many, many of them that we don't believe in because of either ideological or policy or whatever it, it, it might be. But the, the, the very same principles as we speak about capitalist, free market as a businessman, um, are the issues that I'd say many black South Africans are trying to call out and say that the DA is problematic <coughs> because they believe in capitalism, capitalism, further exploitation of black people who are the majority of the labor force. And Sir Ramaphosa seems to represent that too. So maybe that's why the, the distinction is difficult to make. I think 90% of South Africans don't understand what capitalism or socialism mm -hmm. or communism is. What 90% of South Africans see is that the majority of the people in our country uh, who are poor or are, you know, there's some sort of inequality are black. And when you are given a reason that sounds like it makes sense um, by people who you, you know, you look up to, politicians are supposed to come and tell you the truth, then you'll believe that. The real problems that we have in the country are, um, number one, corruption. You know, we have lots of money that could be spent much more wisely. Two is policies. So BE, it doesn't empower the man on the street. BE empowers Ramaphosa and his friends to get more. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not, that's not because of white monopoly capital and all these sorts of things. Um, the problem is policy uncertainty. So why would you invest to create jobs when you know that your, your factory might be taken away from you? And I know that's the most extreme version of it, but that's what the law would allow, essentially. Uh, or nationalization, or the fact that you have no power to run your factory. So 
the the idea of capitalism being the problem is an excuse rather is a disguise rather than actually dealing with the systemic problems that we have in South Africa. Mm -hmm. I do think, however, and this is probably you know the evolution of how capitalism works is that capitalism ha has to some extent, but also needs to to evolve. Um, so it's not the hardcore capitalism of you know you know Stalin's yeah. communism versus capitalism yeah. back then, but there does need to be a more socially responsible capitalism, and I think you see that in many many businesses how, and, and how they give back, whether it's through bursaries or building or whatever they might be. So the so the hardcore capitalism of what you know the ANC goes out and speaks about, not the ANC actually, it's more the EFF mm -hmm. speaks about, hardly exists anymore. Um, but it's the rhetoric, it's the story that they tell. It's, you know, they're still living in 50 years ago, 60 years ago, where you know, Soviet, the Soviet Union still exists and we're fighting communist versus capitalist. That's the story that they tell because it sounds good. You know? But that's not the problem. You, know, you can't grow business without electricity. You, you, can't, you can't grow business. People aren't going to invest in South Africa when you know, their primary concerns are you know, the SDGs, the United Nations Development Goals, whereas our primary concern is BE certif certification. And the two are, they, they're not interchangeable, interlinked. And there's a barrier there. Um, it's silly decisions around um, land expropriation or nationalization or, or all these sorts of things, legislation around mines that chase, chases people away. Um, and what is it disguised as? Capitalism. Why? Because it sounds good. And when you add white monopoly onto it, oh, then it's even great. <laughs> But, but, but Chris, you have, you have um, uh, statistically, you, you still have black people majority living in poverty. You still have only 10% of the country earning more than 7,000 rand a month. That is absolutely absurd. Mm. Collectively in a household, 10% of the country earns more than 7,000 rand a month, of which you have only about 78% uh, uh, of, uh, of the JSE listed board members are still white men. Not even just white people, white men. So surely, Chris, um, if you are saying let's scrap employment equity, triple BEE, you need to give me a solution that is better. And what is that solution from the DA? Because the triple BEE may be not working in implementation. Maybe that's what we need to address. But on paper, it, it actually speaks not just to black people. Mm -hmm. It speaks to black women who are even further disadvantaged. It speaks to the disabled. It speaks to children being empowered. So the definition is actually quite broader mm -hmm. than just tenderpreneurs who go to Cubana and Chao Moets and Gucci. You know these you know? things, eh? <laughs> Um, no, I, I agree with you completely, um, and, and I'll say s separate the, the two issues slightly, because they're mm -hmm. interlinked, but separate. Mm -hmm. So, one BEE was a compromise between the nationalist government, the apartheid government, and the ANC, to say, how can we enrich people quickly um, to benefit as the same as all the nationalists? Mm -hmm. I mean, they were also corrupt, all the, all the nationalist guys. So that was a compromise. That's not, that's not a, a great policy statement. You have, mm -hmm. a, you have a policy that excludes, sorry, that, that gives the majority an advantage, whereas the minority doesn't have any sort of advantage according to that policy. It's one of a kind in the world, despite our challenges being the same as other countries that have come out of that same sort of system or, or history. The DA has a solution, and we're the only political party that has an alternative policy to BEE, and that is our social justice policy. And what that says is that our interventions need to be needs-based. And, and inevitably, by it being needs-based, you're going to address 95% of the people who are most in need are black mm -hmm. South Africans or you. women or disabled mm -hmm. as you know, the different categories. And that's by virtue of statistics. So how do you define these needs? So our policy is based on those SDGs mm -hmm. to say that there are, there are multiple layers of what you can call development or interventions or transformation. It's not just about the business owner. It's about the quality of the education. It's about you know, whether or not you have water. Do you have public transport? All of these things are inequality. All of these things add to poverty. So poverty, inequality, and employment is not just a, a sort of a, a single type of problem. It's mm -hmm. not just about black people not having jobs. You know, it's about does the education that someone gets allow them to get a job? I hear you. Does, you know, can someone... No, what, what is the, the, la the latest statistic? Was it 40% of, of household income is spent on transport? Yeah, yeah. You know, so, so that's already, that's discrimination. Mm -hmm. That's inequality. But we don't address that issue. Why? Because it's not sexy. It, do, it, doesn't, it doesn't talk to a, a vote-winning strategy. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But that's what, that's what the DA says. It says, how can we reward, you know, the 78% of white males in the JSE 
when I say reward, how do we incentivize giving back as opposed to saying, by the fact that you're, you are white, you're already the enemy. And already okay. you're going to get a pushback. So we, 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 we will never coexist if we think the solution is to just take back from them. Yeah, with, because, by force. Because you know, how, and using how policy that to so take far? back by force. That, you know? that hasn't worked it for the last 20, yeah. what, 27, 28 yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. So what we're saying is that if you have a needs-based system, mm -hmm. number one, you take out any sort of discrimination. So I, there are poor white people, there are poor Indian people, Absolutely. there are poor colored people out there. Um, why, why should government have a system that discriminates against those people, not all of them, but why should we have a system that discriminates them when they are equally as poor or equally as unequal as someone who, you know, who has money at the top? If we look at needs, then we address everyone. We're saying that we recognize that you know, 95% of the people who actually need intervention in this country are black South Africans. Mm -hmm. But what we're also doing is we're not going, we're not re re resorting to an arbitrary measure of race-based policies, because mm -hmm. that's what it is. So we fought against apartheid to get rid of race-based policies, only to implement a different one that has failed and benefited a few elite. I hear you. And then what do we do? We blame white monopoly capital, mm -hmm. when white monopoly capital is the employer, it is the one doing corporate social investment. I mean, it's not, it's not clean and it's not perfect. I mean, there's lots of things that we need to fix there. But at the same time, we make an enemy of the people that we should be saying, well, listen, we can actually, you've got more power to go and fix a school or you could fix a road or invest in whatever it might be, healthcare. But we've made you the enemy simply by the fact that your skin color is white, as opposed to saying, how can we help those in need? And if you want to look at how that model is being implemented, you look at the Western Cape. You look at DA governments where we've been in power for much longer, you know, the Cape Towns and that. And that's not to say that there's not, there's not problems in these places. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, they're not islands, you know, they're not, there's not a wall around them or a sea separating yeah. the, those places. But if you look at the opportunities, and it goes back to the first conversation we had, you know, people often say, but why does Kailicha still look like Kailicha? If you go to anywhere in the world, there's, there are places and cities for higher income and lower income. That's, that's, you know, you're never going to have an, an equal income. Yeah. But in Kailicha, you have the highest quality healthcare, you have the best quality social services, it's clean, the electricity stays on, um, there's public transport, what is the bus transport system there? My Rea city. My think, city, yeah, Rio Vias yeah. in, in, in Joburg. In Joburg. Yeah. Um, so your quality of life, I mean, you, you have higher prospects of getting a job, you have you know, better access to, to information through public Wi-Fi. So there's all these opportunities that exist. So there will always be a migratory. There will always be people coming in who are lower income and people who are lower income who grow in the ladder and move from Kailicha to a different place. And that's, I mean, that's how it happens. I started off at a minimum wage, not a minimum wage salary, we had a very low salary and I started working and I stayed with three other people in a house and we shared the rent and then you get a better job and you better job and you move and out of those areas. Yeah, yeah. And that's the same with cities. But what we can't have is places like in Eteguini, where the quality of life of people living in Umlazi or, I mean, look at some of the huge informal settlements like Keita Manor, places like that, hardly get better and in some cases get worse. The, the statistics of rape and crime get worse as opposed to in Kailicha where it gets better. Mm -hmm. um, or the access to health care. You don't have, I mean, when last did Prince Mushieni Hospital get, get upgraded? And it's like a death trap when you go there. Um, but and it's then, one of the biggest in the province. Yeah. yeah. And then you go to the Kailicha Hospital, and it's a state-of-the-art hospital, um, serves thousands or what, hundreds of thousands of people, and it's, and it's there for people to use. So that's the difference, is that we, we, you know, DA government is not going to solve everything as an island. But if we create access to opportunity and we make access to those opportunities needs-based, you know, there's no reason why Ramaphosa's kids, uh, or my kids, should get free education. Mm -hmm. But why, why should someone who cannot afford mm. not get free education? So it's You will identify that need of, obviously you'll have a threshold and say, okay, they need, this is the threshold, yeah. and they can get access then to support from government. Because and we do it already, you know that. I, I, Sasa does it. Yeah. You can't get a, a Sasa grant unless you have you know, a household income lower than whatever. Yes. Housing. You don't qualify for an RDP house. So it's nothing new that you, it's you, nothing you, new. you are going to be implementing should you be in government? The, the new part is basing it on the SDGs okay. to say that let us bring an internationally recognized system because that's what companies, that's what a foreign direct investment is looking for because mm -hmm. they, they get marked on that. European countries, they say, okay, SDG 5, oh, you failed. SDG whatever, you failed. And it's, it's big there to a point where we fail because we don't have the, those sorts of incentives for people to come here to say, hey, listen, come invest in South Africa and you can tick your SDG about environmental, whatever it might be. 
We don't. We say, ah, you know, what's your black percentage share? Uh, it's only 30, you know, you have a European company with 15% black owners. And you're like, well, obviously, you know, that's where the vittos come from. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's only going to be 15%. But mm -hmm. we block you from coming to invest in South Africa because we want you to artificially change something. Instead of saying, okay, that's fine, but how are you going to realistically and materially change the lives of poor and unequal South Africans? So, uh, on a lighter note, you are... You are... A Hilton boy, <laughs> which means many would assume you are uh, top 1%. You went to Hilton, you went to one of the country's best private schools. How are you then going to resonate with the, 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 the citizens of Umgeni? Because it's a very rural area if you're a Hilton boy. So where's the bridge between you and them? It's empathy, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you don't, I believe, you don't have to grow up in an in informal settlement to mm -hmm. know hardship. Um, yeah. You know, it, I mean, there's experience and then there's the willingness to learn and mm -hmm. actually do it you know, meaningfully. So, I mean, we're just having a conversation now. I, I spent three years in Laz, um, from the huge mansions out towards Mbumbulu mm -hmm. um, to, you know, Mkuku there, like in, in what's it, V section. Mm -hmm. um, but to go into people's homes, um, to and but to do it meaningfully, not just because there's cameras there and whatever. But you know that's that's how I grew up. I grew up in the farming areas, so I've I've seen you know poverty. I've seen rural poverty. Um, so it's not something new to me. Um, Hil Hilton was the mm. the place that was strange to me. Mm -hmm. uh, that that was strange to me. Um, not necessarily the rural aspect of what I deal with every day or the, the poverty or the inequality or whatever it might be. That was that was familiar. Hilton was was the thing that was like, wow, no, you're dead, yeah, you're dead. Yeah, you know, like yeah. yeah, so I mean how do you get access to Hilton? So my father and my cousin went there. Okay. So uh, I got a discount. <laughs> <laughs> but I used to um uh, you know when I first started and I think many many kids might have the same experience is that, you know, you know Patrice Mutsepa's kids were arriving in helicopters and there was Ferraris and whatever and people were arriving and then my dad would come and drop me at school uh, in his old clapped out bucky, you know, so, you know, it would be falling apart and it would be filthy because, we, you know, he's been farming or whatever. Um, you know, and you first get there and you're like, wow, you know, you check all these guys getting dropped off here. But then, you know, you actually learn that there's, there's grit mm -hmm. in the background that you come from. So... Definitely not not the one percent. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we're never we never. I mean, there's always food on the table, and you know, we could go to good schools. But um, you know, I, I was there was a there was an upper one percent at Hilton, and I definitely <laughs> wasn't that. You know, I, I was the so there's bursary kids, discount kids, and then there's a exactly the upper one so percent at Hilton. There's the there's the full price kids, you know. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, but but that was an experience for me. Um, I always uh, I always felt more comfortable. Outside of the, the, the sort of the, the formal situations of, you know, the, the traditional events and forums. Um, so whether it was the outreach that we used to do to Sunfield mm -hmm. or down to the Hilton College Valley, um, being on the estate um, or, or welcoming, you know, people for the, the what do we call them, the, the Vula program that was mm -hmm. there, you know, doing those sorts of things. Just because I, I was more familiar with those type of people. That's how I grew up. Um, as opposed to having to learn a new situation, which was, you know, how, how to behave as, as part of the upper echelons of, of, of children in South Africa. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a great experience. I think from, from there, um, you know, you realize what opportunity gives you. So you can do anything at Hilton. You can do any sport, you can do any cultural activity. There's an estate, there's golf. I mean, there's everything. Debating, you can do anything. And I immersed myself in that. I did as much as I could all the time. I used to, uh, I suppose I get in trouble now if I was at school, but um, because I can speak Isuzu, I used mm -hmm. to make uh, friends with all the security guards because I knew that, you know, curfew was whatever, half past eight or nine o'clock, but that because I was so busy doing, you know, whatever it was, that I was only going to, like, I'd be walking around campus at 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And if you were doing that, you used to get in trouble. Mm. But because I was friends with the security guards, they're like, ah, oh, Papa, I said, no, it's fine. So, why is Upuma And then you'd like, you'd, I'd go back to the, to the dormitory. But 
yeah, I was always busy. And, and that's, you know, if people could have those opportunities in South Africa, it would be fantastic. And do you also think that also Kulmizulu makes you relatable to your, your, your constituents and your citizens, you know? Um, there, I definitely think there are things you can't understand when there are certain members of your community who can't communicate with you as the mayor, who if they see you walking, I don't know, past the hall or on a field, they try to talk to you, but they can't express what their problems are fluently because they, they don't know English. And by the way, people don't know this, Zulu is the most spoken language in the country. So do you definitely think that's an advantage? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, to be able to understand someone is, is, is one thing. So, mm. I mean, that helps me a lot because there's words in Isuzulu that aren't the same in English. Absolutely. And I always use the, the word as an example, klonipa. Mm. The direct translation is respect, mm -hmm. but it's, it means so much more in Isuzulu to yeah. klonipa. Um, but then the opposite is true as well, is that there, there are some things that I communicate better to Isuzulu speakers because I've translated it in my head. I hear you. So, I know what the English phrase is or the English meaning um, and I've managed to unpack it in Isuzulu to make sense because there's no direct translation. Yeah. So it, it works both ways. <laughs> also still on that light note. So how do you switch from, I think it was December 2020, fitness, Herbalife to I want to run for mayor, like that, that transition. You, I think you're a chilled guy, you know, you're an easygoing person. Maybe you still are. And it's just the office that you are in that makes people think you're more serious. But how do you transition from that of being the guy next door to now I want to be mayor and to have a serious office in, in my life? I'm still the guy next door. You reckon? I, I've just got more responsibilities. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I don't come from a political family. So yeah. you know, for me to go out to the local pub and have a beer with my friends, I still do that because that's what I do. I'm, I'm not someone special now. I mean, I have the bodyguard sitting in the background because, you know, I'm fighting corruption and whatever, but it's, I'm still me. So, yeah, I, th I think we view politicians as, I don't know, there's some special thing. We, we want relatable people, surely. Surely you want someone who is running your, your municipality but, who you but, can but, sit down and have a beer with and just have a conversation. But Chris, for the longest time, people are not accessible as politicians. They, they've created a celebritism towards themselves, you know. Politicians really want to be celebrities. And that's possibly why we are where we are as a country. And, that, and that's why there's always so much fanfare when this politician leaves and goes to that party or whatever, because it's not you. actually about the delivery, it's about the personality. And you know, like we, we oh, it's, it's exhausting. You know, people want relatable people. My, my whole team, no, I always, you know, I, I get free stuff all the time. When I mean free stuff, like tickets to this and tickets to that, and can you come do here and come and shake this hand and whatever. And you always, I always remind myself that it's, it's not me. People don't want me. Mm. They want the office. I hear you. Um, and what it comes with and, and what being associated with the office means. Exactly. Yeah. So I always remind my team about, about that. You know, whether you're the deputy mayor, speaker, whatever you are. Um, it's, yeah. It's, it's not, it's, it's the office. And what you do with the office is important, not what you know you do with yourself while mm -hmm. in office. It's, the, it's what you define that office as. So never forget that, because when you know in five years' time I'm no longer the mayor, you know then suddenly you know no uh, free ticket. New, new new flavor. You know there's a new flavor in in, in town. Um, but you are being relatable. You know we come from the community. Why must we suddenly distance ourselves? Chris, why is firstly Johannesburg Gauteng is the, the, the heart of our economy in South Africa. Um, most head offices, industry is there, yes, and uh, parts of industry and other parts of the country, but we all know that the bulk of the economy is in Gauteng. Why is the DA messing up the coalitions? Define messing up because you, 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 because you, you're you've, jumped, them. you've jumped to a conclusion here. <laughs> you're messing them up, Chris. You're losing them. Why are you losing them, Chris? You've worked so hard to gain them. Um, you've, you, you, you've said you're going to show change there, vote for change, vote for jobs. That's what the DA says. Um, you attempt to do something when you get the mayorship positions there and then it disappears so quickly as well. What, what's going wrong? Because people with smaller amounts of votes... So in other words, a party with one or two seats out of 200 or 400, whatever the Joburg Council is, have disproportionate democratic power compared to bigger organizations. Mm -hmm. So you have people like the Patriotic Alliance, you have people, uh, you know, these Smolanyana parties, um, who have one or two seats, 
who suddenly are, what do they call themselves? They always say they're the king makers. Mm -hmm. So you have entire cities, you know what Joburg is at the moment, six million people mm -hmm. being held ransom because people want positions and power as opposed to trying to put the broader interests of the city at heart. Um, so it's, it's not so much about the DA, but about how many political parties you have in a coalition. So there are co there's coalitions that work, and there's coalitions that work really well. Um, but as soon as you start putting people together who actually aren't interested in governance, but are actually are interested in, in power at the time, then it becomes more difficult to, to manage. You, I mean, the city of Cape Town started with, I think it was a nine-party a nine coalition mm -hmm. when Helen Zilla was mayor back in the day. Um, and it was very difficult to run, but they managed it because most of the coalition partners, one, could agree on the rules. And that's the problem in Gauteng, is that you come up with a, a coalition agreement, and then th those are the rules, those are, that's the contract between everyone. Uh, but then, because the different opportunity comes along for a different political party, those smaller Nyana ones, then suddenly the rules no longer apply. And I think that's why there's a big push to change national legislation to say, well, South Africa is going into a future of coalitions, mm -hmm. but there's no, there's no laws that govern, guide, regulate how these things can take place. Other countries have them, and it works really well. They have stable coalitions. Sweden, Germany, Denmark, all these countries have stable coalitions for years and years and years. Yeah. But ours is, it's basically, you know, it's what opportunities are presented at the time. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much about the DA failing to run coalitions, but the fact that coalitions are new to South Africa, firstly, some people don't want them to work because they want to, th they want to prove that, mm, you see, 2024. The ANC must come back. Exactly. <laughs> um, you know, they're trying to portray that coalitions are a greater evil than the ANC. Now, mm -hmm. there's no greater evil than, than, than the mafia state that's been created. There is none. Perhaps maybe an EFF ANC coalition is the greater evil, but there is no greater coalition than, than the mafia gangster party that is in government at the moment. But Chris, if, if the DA really believes about doing things for the citizens, then why do you get instances like with Dr. Palazze, Dr. Mpo Palazze, where she says, my, my voice wasn't even heard when I said, let's work with the EFF. I'll come back to that. I'll, I'll, I just want to re-emphasize that you said it's about the people, it's about getting the job done. Aren't you politicking as well by saying, we will never work with the EFF? Because no. that's an opportunity to still lead uh, using Dr. Mpo's vision there in that coalition, but just that you got into some sort of negotiation with the EFF. No, not at all. So, so you, you, you enter into agreement, whether it's in the business world or in politics, you enter into agreements with people who share your vision, values, principles, mm -hmm. broadly, but at least you can agree on more than you disagree with. Why would the DA go into a formal partnership with people who stand up on stages and say that they must kill certain groups of people, or that we they must uh, we must expro we, we must get rid of property rights in the country, or that we must have purely open border systems with no sort of security or control? Um, you know these are or nationalized na you know, nationalized government entities and just nationalized in general, centralized power, Im uh, implement cater deployment systems in government. These are fundamental principles. Of governance that you won't regress on or negotiate. No, it's non-negotiable. There are certain non-negotiables. They are fundamental. They are fundamental yeah. to, to us. It's 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 like going to the EFF and saying, "Will you enter an agreement with us?" Uh, but you must abandon land expropriation uh, without compensation as a principle. Mm -hmm. The EFF is not going to do that, but they don't get crucified for not abandoning their principle. We do, because suddenly we get told that no, we are not considering coalitions or whatever. If you go to the EFF and say, you know, stop going around and, and saying we're going to kill different groups of people, even if, if they don't mean it and it's just for political rhetoric or whatever it is, mm. they're not going to do that. So why must we abandon our principles as an organization? Um, you know, there's, there's, there's political parties like the ACDP, Freedom Front, COPE, um, IFP, all these political parties who, who have very much similar, they have, they have differences um, on, on paper in terms of their principles. But we can broadly agree. We say, okay, well, all of us don't want this. All of us don't. All of us believe that we must in the rule of law or constitutionalism mm -hmm. or whatever it might be. So we can all agree on those. Yes, we differ. You know, should roads be the priority or, or, or health care? Should you know the, the governance type issues? Those things we they sit and discuss and, and you plan around you know around the table. But principles, you don't negotiate your principles, um, and that's the thing. How you know it's. There's, and there's also a difference. I don't think um, Dr. Palazzi has ever said, let's go into agreement with the EFF and mm -hmm. make them our friends. It's more of how can we just keep them quiet and, and keep them happy um, without messing up the coalition. 
But again, you, you're making people happy just for the sake of power. And that's not what we're about. We'd rather be a good opposition party than compromise our values and principles just for the sake of, of power. Um, so yeah, it's always, it's always a, a difficult, you know, it's a difficult decision to, to make. And that's also why we try and externalize some of the decision making around coalitions. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, here yeah, I'm really passionate about my community. So I want to see change and, you know, I'll, I'll work with whoever just for the sake of making this municipality be better. But when you look at it from the outside, it actually doesn't have, have relevance for everyone in the country, mm. or, or more broadly so. So that's why we also externalize a little bit the, the idea of coalition making, not so much coalition management, but coalition making um, in the Democratic Alliance. Um, Ongeni municipality is now debt free, according to you. <laughs> Maybe you must send us emails of evidence, eh? Oh, well, DBSA, <laughs> I'll send you, the, I'll send you the, the, the letter from DBSA. And it's not just politicking. Um, a 10 million rand loan has been paid off. How are you achieving such things, Chris? Because if people were here for decades and we, we've never heard of such things, people were getting qualified audits. Um, does it mean the money has just always been there and people have been misusing it? Yes, partly. Mm -hmm. um, so it's actually our second loan, by the way. We paid off a 2 million rand loan in February, but it okay. didn't sound so great, so we didn't publicize it. See? Um, <laughs> so we've actually paid off 12.4 uh, million, um, which doesn't sound like a lot, but for a small municipality, yes. that's, that's a lot of money. Yes. Um, so to go back to your question, mismanagement of funds, um, poor internal controls, um, horrible prioritizing, a lack of understanding of how budgets work and just finances in general, um, and the inability to make tough short-term decisions. Yeah. So yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of things. poor governance, um, mismanagement of funds. It's, it's this, the same story that we we know around South Africa. Just have to make better decisions, tough decisions. You know, that means that there's 10.4 million rand less in our budget this year. Um, but what it does mean is that next year there's 10.4 million rand extra plus the interest plus we would have access to new loans. Our loans were taken to pay salaries and to pay ESCOM. Now that has no value to the people of Umgeng. There's Absolutely. no houses, no roads, no water, no whatever that's been, been installed. We now have access to 30 million rands worth of loans to be able to do capital infrastructure, not mm -hmm. to pay salaries, but to, to do those things that people want to see, the street lights, the whatever it might be. So. It's longer term planning, but short term, you know, tough decisions. And another, here's, here's another tough decision we made, is we get 24, or 25 million rands worth of municipal infrastructure grant, MIG funding every financial year. Mm -hmm. We could have taken that money and, and built a whole lot of roads or a hall or whatever it might have been for that 24 million rand. But we also know that we've got a problem with plant and equipment. So we haven't mm -hmm. got vehicles and all these specialized equipment. So we took that money and instead of building roads, which look great, I can go and cut ribbons and you know, it looks fantastic. Yeah. You see me on Facebook, they're cutting ribbons and <laughs> digging, digging holes. But we said, let's buy plant and equipment mm -hmm. because what, we meet, what that does is that it's not just a one-year program, it's a 15-year program because now you've got plant and equipment. You save on contract costs, um, you save on, on broken machinery, on workshop, on overtime because people now have to use the same truck multiple shifts. Mm -hmm. So you do that. So you don't look good in the community because you've built a road, but you know that in two, three, four, five, ten years, that investment, that hard decision now is going to pay off. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, you, 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 your lovely truck, your lovely TLB, it's just like an ornament and everybody like the mayor just bought it to look at it. <laughs> yeah, I know, but it's just now working, it's, it's digging grades, cleaning dump sites, uh, illegal dump sites. Um, cutting trees, lifting people to cut trees, clearing roads, you know, it's, it's amazing what one small thing can do for so much in terms of service delivery. I mean, that's 1.6 million rand that, you know, we spent on that. So it's a lot of money. Uh, are you not going to become arrogant that every day when you, not every day, but many times when you log on Facebook, I look through your comment section and people are always praising you. People are happy with what you are doing. Um, we can't always have conversations and interviews where we're complaining and we're trying to dig for the bad things. Um, I will praise you for that. You, you're doing a great job, at least from what we see from far. I hope that's what people in your community are feeling as well. Um, is Chris not going to get a big head quickly that he's the best thing ever? No. Um, like I said, I, I, you know, when we were campaigning, our entire... You know, because I mean, it's frustrating campaigning, there's mm -hmm. a lot of effort, time, and you know, people, you know, you spend a lot of time with people and you end up 
fighting, not badly, just, you know, he spent too much time with them. And we'd always sit around the table and he said, there, there's two things that we must always remember. It's like, one, our slogan is we're not doing this for status, mm-hmm. we're doing this for sacrifice. So that's, we always return to that. And then secondly, it was, we, we didn't just want to win the municipality. Mm-hmm. The DA wanted to win the municipality so that they can govern. We, as community members, under the DA banner, wanted to win so that we could change lives. I hear you. Um, and being a celebrity doesn't change, change lives. Um, rolling up your sleeves, getting dirty, making good decisions, and sometimes making bad ones, learning from your space, being honest, transparent, that's what changed lives. Um, you know, if, if people want to praise you for that or give you good, you know, good, good messages, um, it makes the job easier, um, as opposed to being you know, a corrupt, useless politician who never does anything and whatever. Yeah. Um, it does make it easier, but at no stage, um, I mean, the bubble will burst sometime, I'll do something stupid, um, and then, you know, the bubble will burst. But, you know, the mission remains the same. It's not about me. It's about the people out there. Would you consider yourself a career politician? Um, I don't want to be. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've worked in the private sector. Um, I've worked outside of the formal political structures. Um, I don't come from a political family. Um, I don't owe anyone anything in mm-hmm. politics in terms of, you know, positions or whatever. Even as deputy leader of, of the province, I don't back a slate and all these things that people do um, so no I don't think I'm a career politician I, d- I don't want to be in politics forever uh, when I say politics like you know an office bearer or, or you know something like that I would love to become an official at some stage mm-hmm. and after that you know move on to something like the United Nations or the World Health Organization yeah. or, but it, you know, it, it, like so that. I, that what I'm getting is you just always want to be of service yes I want okay. to be in governance of service um, yeah that's uh, it's fulfilling. It's, yeah. it's, 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 I mean, I'm not going to get rich doing it unless I do it like some other people. Um, but if I had to work the same amount of hours and put, and if I had the same risks and stresses and in the private sector, you know, I get paid a lot more for what I do, but that's not why I do it. And you know, you, you, you do it not to get rich. If, if you if you if you think this is a career when you, that you're going to get rich, then you're entering it wrong and you will make decisions that are not lawful or legal and to benefit yourself. And that's not right. 65% of registered voters did not go to the polls and actually cast that vote. I find that a lot of political parties fight each other instead of fighting for that pool of 65% of people who are supposed to be registering, supposed to be voting on voting day, right? Yeah. So, so I agree. Um, you only have to look at you know, what's this new political action is at, for yes. example. They're not fighting for new votes. They're fighting for the DA's votes. Mm-hmm. So they claim to be an organisation that's going out there to to bring the ANC out of government, or whatever it might be. But they're doing nothing to win ANC votes or to win those those voters that you're talking mm-hmm. about. We did that differently here. Um, we out registered. The ANC, uh, which is the next biggest political party. Mm-hmm. So what we did is that we went and found people who were unregistered or registered incorrectly or just moved to the area and then obviously couldn't participate in democracy in this area. And we outregistered, I think it was about 63%. Now you can imagine, I mean, that's quite an achievement for a party that is significantly smaller in terms of, of numbers on the ground than the ANC. So that was the first battle won, mm-hmm. is registration. Um, and we'll continue to do that. Um, if you're not registered, you can't vote. It's too bad. Um, and you are not in the decision-making yeah. processes. So that's it's, it, and and that's what we're doing now. There's a huge, huge part of South Africa that is that hasn't got a voice, um, and those are the people that we try to to get to as the DA in the area. That we try to speak to those people to say, there's an alternative. Don't don't lose hope in the democratic process as a vehicle for change or a vehicle for improvement. It, it can happen. You don't have to just have the IFP or the ANC or you know, the NFP as your government and things go backwards. They, you know, it's not perfect here, but we're moving forward, it's not backwards. Mayor Chris Papas, thank you. Um, it's been amazing. Uh, you, I, 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 I personally, I think you're an incredible person. Um, we're still yet to see what your political career will bring. Um, I hope that the viewers will get an understanding of you and what you are trying to do better for the Umgeni municipality and just the, 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 to get how you think so that because, as you're saying, you have aspirations of going national and, and, and. 
one day when you do go national, um, people will know who you are and what you stand for. And the beauty of the internet is that these conversations will remain. So when you are campaigning nationally, people will come back and, and say, this is what Chris stands for, mm. you know. And that, yeah, it's, it's, it's a document, I suppose. So you, you, you can't be fake. Yeah, young politicians can't be be fake so far as you, you as you said you yeah. have come from you know the life I think there's a couple of topless pictures on my Instagram <laughs> as well, um, but that's who I am you know I'm a human being I'll make mistakes I will you know I draw on advice I you know I grow I learn and uh, I think that's what we we need more of in South Africa yeah. is not celebrity politicians as you say. Ladies and gentlemen, that was another episode of Engineer Your Life with Umgeni, Municipality Mayor Chris Puppers. It's a very beautiful place. It's in the Midlands of KZN. And I think he lives in the best place, one of the best places in South Africa, honestly. I was jealous as I was driving here for this conversation. We did manage to speak about his position in the DA. We spoke about um, what he's doing for the municipality and just the macro policies that he believes in and what he, he strives to think about. So that shows a bit of growth and understanding of what we want um, to learn from these conversations that we have with people that we have them with. Next time I'll try to speak to him about his OnlyFans account. <laughs> Do I have one? <laughs> Don't forget to like, subscribe and join as a member. I'll see you on the next episode.